I know many liars doing very well these days, making out airline schedules. Mr. Bojangles, a date which will live in infamy. Time now for Spinning My Dad's Final. Here with all his skips, scratches, and pops is my dad, Frank Beccarello. Thanks, sweetie, and thank you for tuning in to episode 133 of Spinning My Dad's Vinyl. We break out another of my dad's favorite musicians, but he's not a trumpet player. He does, however, play the style of music that is a big portion of my dad's collection, Dixieland. While this album was released 57 years ago, all of the music on it was written over 100 years ago. In fact, four of the songs on this episode were written in the 19th century. So, get ready for some old traditional music in true New Orleans fashion with volume 133, The Village Fountain. Pete Fountain and the Village Scramblers with Dixieland One Step. Although for some reason the record album and the label said One Stop. Not sure why. It was written by Nick LaRocca, Eddie Edwards, Larry Shields, Henry Ragus, and Tony Spabarbo in 1917. And they're all members of the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Okay, why this record for this episode? Well, as I keep shuffling through my dad's vinyl collection to decide what to play, this album kept popping up. This is the last of the three Pete Fountain albums my dad had, but I know he had a couple of cassettes and even more Pete on CD, including the autographed one he and my mom brought back from New Orleans on one of their trips there, and they also brought an autographed CD home for me. And if you're not watching the video version of the show... 
Yes, I am holding them. I know how much my dad enjoyed Fountain's playing, and he's also a musician of choice for me, too. Okay, next up. If you listen real close, you'll hear a children's song within this tune. Think body parts. Did you hear it? Head, shoulders, knees and toes? Knees and toes? <laughs> there is a tavern in the town, a traditional folk song which first appeared in the 1883 edition of William H. Hill's Student Songs. Okay, let me tell you about my dad's vinyl I have chosen for this episode. Pete Fountain, Pete Fountain and the Village Scramblers, Jazz. It's on the Crown Records label, number CLP 5478. It's a vinyl LP album, mono format, was released in 1966. Its genre is jazz, and its style is Dixieland. Now, there were also stereo versions of this record released in the U.S. and Canada, and those albums were laid out in a different order, I noticed. 
we will hear six of the ten songs on this album. Now, there are no liner notes. The back cover is filled, for the most part, with 16 other album covers from Crown Records, with artists like Ray Charles, Etta James, the Dave Clark Five, and the Ink Spots, along with other theme selections. Across the top are the words, Music for Every Mood, and down the side it reads, The Best High Quality Record Value Today. There is nothing about the music inside, and the song list for the album is printed on the front cover. Okay, let's see what prices this record is being sold at on Discogs.com. The mono version has never sold on that website, but there are seven for sale from a buck fifty to four dollars. The last stereo version sold for a dollar ninety nine back in twenty sixteen. I found one on eBay for seven dollars and one on Amazon for ten. Now my dad's record is in fair condition. It seems to be pretty clean between the tracks, not too much crackling. The cover is another story. Very poor condition. There's a tear on the spine that you you could see if you're watching the video version that the album can kind of go through, but not big enough for it to go all the way through. But there is no electrical tape that my dad liked to put on there. There are remains of a label that looks like it could have been used in a radio station and then it was yanked off, but the sticky paper was still left. There's also the green streak on the back cover. So I will value my dad's vinyl at 50 cents. Okay, now, how's that go again from the movie Meatballs? We are the CITs, so pity us. (laughs) 
How many remember that scene from around the campfire? Washington and Lee Swing, written by Mark W. Sheaf, Todd Robbins, and Thornton W. Allen in 1910. Well, we really covered the life of Pete Fountain pretty thoroughly in episodes 25 and 79 of Spinning My Dad's Vinyl. And since this is the last time I'll feature one of his albums on the show, I thought I would take excerpts of his New York Times obituary. Headlined, Pete Fountain, 86, dies. Clarinetist popularized spirited New Orleans jazz by by Peter Keepnews, and it was posted on the day he died, August 6th, 2016. Pete Fountain, a clarinetist who brought the traditional jazz of his native New Orleans to a national audience through frequent appearances on the Lawrence Welk and Johnny Carson television shows, died on Saturday in New Orleans. He was 86. The cause was heart failure, said Benny Harrell, Mr. Fountain's son-in-law and manager. Mr. Fountain was a mainstay in the New Orleans music scene for more than six decades, a familiar sight at Mardi Gras and the annual Jazz and Heritage Festival. And the appeal of his high-spirited brand of Dixieland stretched far beyond New Orleans, especially after he began appearing on The Lawrence Welk Show in 1957. His outgoing musical style made an odd fit with the sedate champagne music of Mr. Welk's orchestra. Mr. Fountain often noted that champagne and bourbon did not mix. But the combination was a hit with viewers, and his segments became a staple of the show. In later years, he also he was also a frequent guest on Mr. Carson's Tonight Show. Peter Dewey Fountain Jr. was born in New Orleans on July 3, 1930, and was exposed from an early age to the lively small group jazz that was an integral part of that city's atmosphere. Inspired by Benny Goodman and the New Orleans clarinetist Irving Fazola, and by a family doctor who recommended that he learn a wind instrument to strengthen his weak lungs, he began playing clarinet at age 12. Before he was out of his teens, he had become a familiar presence in the nightclubs on Bourbon Street. When I was a high school senior, my history teacher asked me why I didn't study more, he wrote in 2001 in the notes of a CD anthology of his recordings from the 1950s and 60s. I answered that I was too busy playing clarinet every night, and when I told him I was making scale, about $125 a week, he said that was more than he made and I should play full-time. I guess I was a professional from that point on. In 1950, after some local success as a sideman, Mr. Fountain formed his own band, the Basin Street Six, with the trumpeter George Gerard. We clowned around a lot with that group, he recalled, but most of the time we played good music. The Basin Street Six broke up in 1954, and he then worked briefly with the Dukes of Dixieland in Chicago before teaming up with trumpeter Al Hurt to lead a band that had a successful extended engagement at a New Orleans nightclub, Dan Levy's Pier 600. A talent scout for Mr. Welk heard him there in 1957 and flew him to Los Angeles for the first of his many featured appearances on Mr. Welk's popular ABC variety show. He soon moved to Los Angeles, but he moved back home after two years. It was the only time in his life that he was away from the New Orleans area for a significant period. In 1960, shortly after returning to New Orleans, Mr. Fountain bought a local nightclub, the French Quarter Inn, and began a residency there with a small group. Eight years later, he opened a larger room on Bourbon Street, Pete's Place. The club moved to the New Orleans Hilton, now the Hilton New Orleans Riverside, in 1977 and remained in business until he reluctantly shuttered it in 2003, citing a decline in tourism after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. I needed a change. I didn't want it, but I needed it, he told The Advocate, a newspaper in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's been a real good ride, and we've still got a lot of writing to do. He continued to perform regularly at a casino in nearby Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, for many years. Mr. Fountain struggled to get his life and career in order after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. The roof was blown off his house in New Orleans. A second house in Bay St. Louis was destroyed. Most of his possessions were lost. Over the next year and a half, by his estimate, he moved eight times. His performance at the 2013 Jazz and Heritage Festival turned out to be his swan song. Last year was his last public performance, Mr. Harrell announced shortly before the 2014 festival. He's fully retired now. And I will drop that link into this show's liner notes. Next up is a song whose lyrics were written by the woman who also wrote the original 1870 pacifist Mother's Day proclamation. But you you won't hear them sung here. Thank you. 
It's the Battle Hymn of the Republic, written by William Steff in 1856, with the lyrics you know but didn't hear, written by Julia Ward Howe. Time now for this episode's interesting side note, and it has to do with one of Pete Fountain's last shows. Here's the online story, Jazz Legend Pete Fountain Pleases Fans with the Standards, posted on Friday, June 15th, 2012, by Katie Van Sickle of NOLA.com. Pete Fountain took the stage at New Orleans Jazz Fest on Sunday afternoon, as any legend should, supported by a bevy of talented musicians, there to let the 81-year-old shine. Fountain, a.k.a. Mr. New Orleans, is considered by many to be the ambassador of Dixieland Jazz, also a fixture during carnival season. Fountain's half-fast walking club has been leading the downtown parade route on Mardi Gras since 1960. Fans were pouring out the sides of the tent as the crowd chanted, Let's go, Pete! to greet the artist with a standing ovation. Smartphones lined the stage to snap his image. Mr. Music, Mr. Pete Fountain! his MC said. Yay, Pete, the crowd responded. In the middle of Lazy River, the legend leaned on a stool to his right for support, but his smile did not fade. He enraptured the crowd during Basin Street Blues. The air smelled like the recognizable Jazz Fest triumvirate of trampled grass, sweat, and beer. A seated patron shushed chatter in the back row. To the left of the stage, couples embraced in a dance on a wooden surface reserved for that purpose. Fountain invited his great-granddaughter, Isabella, to the stage for an adorable rendition of It's a Wonderful World. After a rousing response from fans and a kiss for her great-grandfather, like any good diva, Isabella was whisked off stage and into the crowd. The second line, led by three enthusiastic umbrella carriers, picked up steam. A man with a thick white beard, high socks, and a tag that read, Free Hugs, did a robot dance across the tent. As Fountain served his trademark, A Walk With Thee, the second line still was in full swing, but the majority of the crowd sat calmly and respectfully. For a moment, the reserve tent seemed like the polar opposite of any Springsteen rock-induced mayhem transpiring across the fairgrounds at the Acura stage. Then a, a breeze of smoke blew by, and it was clear that although vibes may be diverse, some Fest fans are on the same party page. (laughs) A photo accompanied this article with the caption, Pete Fountain plays during New Orleans Jazz Fest, accompanied by his great-granddaughter Isabella singing What a Wonderful World. And I'll pop that link into this show's liner notes. And now, probably one of the first tunes I ever learned on the trumpet.
by Wild Irish Rose, written by Chauncey Alcott in 1899. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm certainly glad my dad was a big fan of Pete Fountains. I certainly became one, too. In fact, the episodes of this show I replay the most often are the two previous episodes of his records. He took music that had been played thousands of times and some of it recorded dozens of times and made it sound different and fresh. And on this record, he did it with music that was now written more than a century ago. Plus, I have always been happy that my parents got to see him live at his club in New Orleans. Now, let's finish with his version of the song that opens and closes this show. When the Saints Go Marching In. Now, that song has evolved from an old black spiritual and became famous with Louis Armstrong's 1938 recording. And there you have selections from Mr. New Orleans. 
So thanks for tuning into Volume 133, The Village Fountain, however you did. If you want more information about this show, head over to SpinningMyDad'sVinyl.com. I'll be back next week with all my skips, scratches, and pops for Volume 134, Golden Memories of Radio Part 4. Until then, go with the flow, my friends. (laughs) Thank you.